Hi, I'm Joseph Piper, and um, welcome to the studios at uh, the Elkhorn Valley campus of Metropolitan Community College. Um, today, you're joining us for one of our uh, gallery uh, series talks, a discussion with visiting artists who's exhibiting in the gallery here on campus, the Gallery of uh, Visual Art and Design. And when we come back, um, you'll, we'll, the artists will join us. We'll have a lovely discussion about um, the work and um, just to wet your, pique your interest here, I'll, I'll read your quote. Helen Harrison of the New York Times wrote of this artist, she is especially attuned to the often subtle evidence of human impact on nature. Her work invites speculation about the secrets that may be revealed by close scrutiny and creative speculation. Stay tuned, join me as we have a nice discussion with uh, photographer and uh, artist uh, Terry Warpinski from Oregon. Hi, I'm Joseph Piper. Welcome to the uh, video studios at Metropolitan Community College in Elkhorn Valley. I'd like to welcome my guest today, Terry Warpinski. She's a professor of art at uh, Eugene, Oregon, at the University of Oregon. Um, you teach workshops, most addressing landscape and uh, as subject or alternative archaic photographic processes. You've led courses in the area surrounding the, is it Malher? Mm -hmm. Malher. Uh, National Wildlife Rescue for 20 years, initiated a program in the northern Italian village of Oira, Oira in 2005 and taught multinational field course, a multinational field course centered on the Arava Desert of Israel during her Fulbright Fellowship in 2001. She's photographed all over the world, the United States, Mexico, as well as Central and Eastern Australia. Her recent work has been drawing on imagery from travel through the Middle East, Western Europe and China, um, and she also continues to address the landscape uh, from the coastal rainforest to the sage plain of the high desert. Terry, thank you so much for being with us today. Welcome to the college. Um, tell us about the show that we have um, in, the in the college gallery right now. Sure. So um, the show is called Surface Tension, and it's work that um, is uh, from a project over the last five years. It began in 2009. And the exhibition here um, is the majority of the work. There's a small installment that's also showing uh, in Lincoln uh, at a gallery there called the Workspace Gallery. Okay. Um, so this is a project that looks at um, landscapes of division um, along the U.S.-Mexican border, the Israeli-Palestinian separation wall, and then as a counterpoint, present day Berlin um, with the demise of the Berlin Wall and what has happened in that place uh, since the wall came down. Awesome. So there's, there's uh, I think I have a list here, there's 54 images in the show? Well, all I know is that there are, there are the 70 two. total, so I'm not, I don't know exactly what the number is for okay, the Okay, so, so that's quite a number of images. Um, but they're split between the two galleries then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what what was the sort of instigator of the germ that came about to, to do this project? Um, there were multiple germs. <laughs> I would say um, probably, I mean, having lived in, um, in Israel back in 2000, certainly um, predicated uh, the work in a very particular way. But in reality, it was in 2009, I was on a sabbatical from the university, and I was in New Mexico uh, teaching a course down in Las Cruces and revisiting the landscape of uh, Chihuahua, Sonora, Arizona, New Mexico that I had been working in 10 years earlier. And um, it was a time of great change in that spot because the um, issues around border security had heightened. Obama had just been elected president but hadn't taken office, and there was a much concern that um, the fence that was proposed and funded was not going to be built if it wasn't built before uh, January 20th. Um, so I was there at the height of, of that activity and um, a little shocked and certainly awed by the, um, by the huge impact that that border structure had. And so that really became the seed that um, then compelled me to um, remember my experience in the Middle East and how Israel had proposed building a separation barrier between the Palestinian territories and Israel. 
Um, and I thought that that was um, the most remarkable and uh, bodacious idea back in 2001 and seemed inconceivable. Well, with seeing what had happened along our border, it made me realize that it was, it was actually realizable. And uh, I decided to return to the Middle East to see what had happened, to, be, to begin to compare those two landscapes together. So that's how it began. Okay. Um, tell us about how did the process, the image making process start? Is it, do you, do you plan a lot ahead or is it, is it a lot of spontaneity? Is it a lot of sort of collaging of, of, of what you've gathered and sort of pulling things out and isolating them and dismissing other images, that kind of process? It's all of that. It's all of that? Yeah, so I mean, it, it begins with um, shooting. I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily have a plan, like a script on what I'm going sure. to go photograph. Um, I'm much more putting myself into situations which I believe will yield me the kinds of experiences that I want to, to be involved with, the things that I'm, I'm wanting to understand, because that's much of, of what drives my, my interest is, is learning through my work. Um, and so, I, and I shoot a lot um, uh, without a lot of uh, censorship going on. Uh, I, I, meaning that I don't stop myself if I think something is going to be interesting. I, I photograph it every which way I can, and then spend a lot of time um, uh, when I'm back from the field of working with those images, considering what what I have in fact done. And, um, and once I feel like I've got you know, um, a group of images that I think pass muster for me on my aesthetic and, and technical um, uh, requirements, I will print them out in a, like an old rough contact sheet form and chop them up and just begin working with images to look for relationships that might uh, inform one another in particular ways. Are, are, now, are these digital images or are they a mix of those and traditional? These, um, the, the work ultimately ended up being entirely digital, but that was not my, in, my initial impulse was that this was a film-based project. I began shooting in black and white okay. and was simply using a digital camera as a way of my doing immediate note taking. Um, because I, you know, you, I have then a, an absolute way to sort of track where I've been every day, what the order and sequence was, where with rolls of film, of course, that you know I, I mark them all, but they can get jumbled, and so my digital files would would sort of help me piece that back together again, and also let me do some testing in terms of what conditions were like and that sort of thing. Um, and it was two years into the project that I realized that it it really functioned better as a color. Uh, work rather than uh, uh, black and white for many reasons. I think the, the, the color kept me from overly aestheticizing or romanticizing the landscapes, which is kind of my native impulse as a longtime landscape photographer, that the, the grid and reality of the color was actually very important. Um, and I had, I had never really seriously worked digitally before, so it was a big leap for me to do that. Uh, I felt very insecure. So, you, I guess I'm thinking, had you taken a lot of the work in black and white, and now you went back and did a well? I was, I was shooting. So for, I would not shoot a roll of black and white film, and I, sh I shoot, I shoot medium format. So a roll of film is, you know, twelve exposures. I would not shoot a roll of film without having taken a few digital images to simply sort of establish okay. that roll of film. So, so there was a kind of paralleling going on. But my but my my serious intention was behind the the camera when I had the film in it. I was a little bit looser and more casual when I was working digitally, which I think ended up really um, expanding my my visual language in some interesting ways. So I, I didn't go back and rephotograph anything. Okay. But I, I at one point stopped carrying the film camera with me and only carried uh, my main digital camera and then a backup in case, of course, that would fail. Okay. Yeah. Um, was technical considerations were those out front, or was that kind of backseat to capturing the imagery that was catching your eye and? Well, I mean, if sometimes um, technical considerations in the moment certainly take a back seat when I'm out shooting if I don't have the time to sort of stop and think things through. Sure. Um, and so there, of course, there are those disappointments where I, I don't have what I need. I mean, maybe it's there recorded, but in such a pathetically poor way that I would not use it. Right. <laughs> 
Um, and and but that's the, that same thing happens in film too. There are times where we just don't get what we want. Sure. Yeah. Now I was I was looking at some of. Did you paint into any of these images at all? Okay. Some of them just has a little bit of that look in some of them for some reason to me, like almost a wa a watercolor effect or something. No. No, I mean, I, um, so I will say that there are multiple different kinds of cameras that came into play. So I have, I, some of them are um, various iPhones, some of them are my Canon Mark II, some are a Sony RX, some are um, still frames from digital video off of a telephone. So I, I, I like the textured use of photography so that, it, so that the medium has a language of its own. Like if I were a painter, I might have a glaze, or I might right. have a dry brush, or I might have, you know, dabs, or, or I, I'm, I'm interested in that photographically as well, because I think photography is, is such an important um, medium in contemporary culture. We're inundated with it in sure. so many different sure. forms, and we're also, um, photography plays a huge role in control along all of these borders. There are surveillance cameras, everywhere. I mean, I'm being watched by high-powered cameras that are two miles away. There are drones flying overhead. There are citizen groups who are out there with their cameras monitoring situations. So I was interested in inflecting the work with a bit of that. So you're almost in this world of, of photography. I mean, everything's a photo photograph. It's constantly... Constantly, yes. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you're photographing, I'm photographing, you're being I'm being photographed. Precisely. Interesting. Yeah. A lot of your images are diptych and triptych, mm -hmm. and there's like you know either two images next to each other that relate or three images that relate. They're not necessarily the same size. Some might be a, a narrow image with a larger image and a medium image, or or a small image and a large image. How did you? What was the impetus to put things together that way? Well, uh, I'd say that um, initially the impetus was editorial. Was 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 wanting to guide the viewer in terms of a reading across images. And I would see certain things happening that might complement or complicate um, a, 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 an initial image. Um, sometimes I am interested in, in taking a more poetic approach. And in some of the triptychs, I think of them as being like a haiku with three observations um, that, that come together and create a whole that is something beyond the individual parts of the image. Um, I began that, I, when I first, uh, I showed a segment of the work um, early in the project, maybe in 2012, and I had worked with just sequencing of individual frames, um, and this was looking at the work from the Middle East and the work from um, the U.S.-Mexican border, and I had sort of done this sort of parallel rows of images, and I wanted, I was hoping that the viewers would look at them in a certain way, but they began reading them up and down and back and forth as, as separate frames, and, and I think it, it jumbled what I saw as being the, the um, how much one could understand of what I was trying to say, was, I felt was like being lost in that kind so of fluid reading. Overwhelming. Yeah. So that's when I um, decided to begin pairing images with inner frame as a clear cue that something, I want you to look at them together. So that's, that's what led to, to that. And is that process, is it just start kind of, you find one and then is it a visual process or is it the content that's guiding you what to it's, put together? It's both, it's both. It's both, but yeah. th does it start visually though maybe or? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm never, I'm not a one size fits all kind of person. Okay. So, and I, and I, I don't have a, a template that's sort of like a methodology that is absolutely consistent. So in some cases it is a visual formal set of relationships that, that first draw me together. At other times it is absolutely a conceptual connection between the two and then I'm really working as hard as I can to make them formally composed together as well as I can. But that's, that's more of the, the fight. So are you using a image that's the same size and the, as a finished piece, or using sort of little like rough prints These or something? Are, well, I, 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 this is where I do small rough prints. I mean, I've got thousands of, of stacks of small prints and, and just begin to move them, move things, to move things around. And then, once I've done that, I mean, I'll tape them down and then I'll go back to my computer and then and, 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 and be, try to find those files in the thousands of them. 
and begin to mock them up, um, you know, as, as, as quick print images to look at in a small scale, like making small eight by tens of okay. those. So and, is, is Photoshop, is using Photoshop to put things together? I don't use part? Photoshop you at all. Photoshop no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of anti-Photoshop. Okay, what, what, <laughs> what do you use digitally to, to oh, work I, with? Oh, I use Lightroom, actually. Okay. I mean, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm very much a purist photographer that okay. way, and, and um, I stay within a, a raw um, workflow of parametric editing, so I don't like to do pixel level editing, so I pretty much just stay out of Photoshop. So the only thing you really use it for is to combine the images or lay out your your sequence. Well, with with light, you know, I do that. In, I do that in Lightroom. I mean, do I do all of the editing? Um, yeah, in Lightroom, okay. and then and then do the pairing and even the printing out of Lightroom. Okay, great. So Photoshop is not. I mean, I think most people would think in this day and age, every photographer would be using Photoshop. Yeah, I, I've I've never been a Photoshop or, or has Lightroom. it has like it's like it's like. It's got too many tools for what I want, mm -hmm. and, and and kind of makes you know the it makes the file management more um, complicated. It makes bigger files than what I want to handle. So, so I, is Lightroom more like a real a real tangible? Tool? Well, like, have you ever edited? Um, have you used a camera raw out of Bridge? I have not. Okay. Well, because it, it's very much that interface. It's pr it's pretty much just like being in the dark room with that set of tools. The, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, your background, you, you've got, um, your education is in the Midwest. You went to the University of Iowa, mm -hmm. and you have a degree in art history, photography, um, and drawing, is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about education. and Like, do you feel like there was an advantage or disadvantage to, to, to staying in the Midwest for graduate school? Well, and, the advantage was financial. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Wisconsin, so we'll, we'll start the story there. And um, I come from a very large family, and I'm the oldest child, and my parents are both teachers, you know, elementary and secondary. Um, and education was very important, but they, I, I had to do my, my education on my own. So, um, so affordability mattered, and I went to the regional school, University of Wisconsin in Green Bay, um, a small school. and. Um, and did my degree in humanistic studies um, with an emphasis in art, and so I, you know, there are things that I, I, I love. Um, I love the college slash university environment as an artist. I think being around um, intellectual ideas that extend outside of simply, you know, what art, what what, what a voice in art can speak about. I think sure. is really excellent. Um, I think that the work ethic in the Midwest is absolutely amazing. I mean, I've taught in the Southeast in Florida. I've been in Oregon for many, many years. I, um, there's, 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 I, there are no students, there are no colleagues that I have in those places who are from someplace other than the Midwest who understand what a work ethic is the way that I think Midwesterners do. Um, Iowa, I mean, I, I, I went to grad school there because they had very strong programs in both um, photography and in printmaking, and I kind of came to photography late. I was actually doing graduate work in printmaking when I first discovered photography. Um, so I was interested in, in going to some place where both of those were strong, and the other school that kind of had that strength was, at, was in New Mexico, which I just logistically couldn't figure out how in the world I could afford to move that far away. So in, in part, my, my decisions were very pragmatic, um, but also gave me a very solid grounding. What was the first photograph you took or experience with photography that, that sort of made that switch go on, that, that set you on the photography path? Um, well, I'm actually going to show that tonight. <laughs> okay. um, uh, I, you know, like, so I kind of backed into photography. I didn't really appreciate um, photography at all as a, as a fine artist, as a painter. I, I thought that the camera was not really a valid creative tool for a long time. I mean, I was in my mid-20s when I finally used a camera as an artist. And what I, what I realized was that I suddenly was dealing with, the, um, with my absolute daily experience in my creative work for the first time. And, I, and so it doesn't matter what the picture was, but it suddenly it was more important than like a still life or a figure study, which seemed to have nothing to actually do with me, but allowed for me to show my skill. Okay. Okay. So the camera 
brought my content into my, into my real relationships, into my experiences. And that's what really hooked me, was that I was, sudden, I was addressing, in a very particular way, something that was, that was real. When you take a photograph, do you think of it as, or is it both, maybe? Uh, I mean, I'm not a photographer, really. I don't know that much. I mean, I've taken photography classes in the past, but that's, you know, got away from where I am now. But do you think of it as capturing a, a very special moment that, that you would miss otherwise if the camera didn't capture that? Or is it setting up and really sort of manipulating what you want to capture on, on the, the, the lens, with the lens? Or is it both? Well, it, it's probably both. I mean, I think there are some times with the camera that I miss things because I have a camera, okay. right? And I'm looking through the through the lens. Like, I mean, famously, I, I made as a college student, I did one study abroad to um, to Italy, and I did not bring a camera with me at all because I wanted to see everything. And of course, I have regretted that um, since. But it was maybe a little overcorrecting for that particular <laughs> uh, occasion. But I, 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 there are times where I, I, um, I think I find, um, I find things I would have missed in my photo. By making a photograph, I find things later that I was not aware of or noticing in the moment that I was actually photographing. I think that there are times where intuitively we're able to operate at a particular level. It's beyond our recognition, and I and. Um, you know, I think a lot about, about vantage point. I mean, I, I, I am somewhat gymnastic with my camera in terms of, you know, I don't just stand with an eye-level view. Right. I don't work with a tripod. I attempt to allow myself to find more than maybe what is even essentially there that I'm noticing at first, you know. And um, camera vision is really quite amazing, I mean, in terms of what it allows in terms of creativity. So. You know, working every control uh, possible. I mean, I always shoot manually. I'm always, you know, making decisions and attempting to give myself options in terms of the way I'm using depth of field or what I'm shoot, you know, what I'm thinking about in terms of the role of movement, how I'm thinking about light. Um, and I got far more playful with that um, in this project, um, doing things that I, you know, never have done before in my in my professional life in terms of like, you know, letting, you know, letting light come through and, you know, bounce around my aperture sure. in the camera. So uh, a, a great photograph doesn't have to be technically perfect, does it? No. It, does, it doesn't. Um, Do you, but it needs to be technically sufficient. Explain, explain that. Well, uh, it, it needs to be able to communicate in a way that doesn't have people caught up in bad technique. Okay, all you, okay. Can you see, don't want to notice, oh, that's a bad photo, but the uh, idea is great. But the idea is great, yeah. right. I mean, it, 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 so it, it's, it's, it's got to be working on multiple cylinders. And it doesn't, you know, and sometimes, um, uh, often, photographs survive well as being technically virtuous but conceptually vacant. And I, I, yeah, I, I would, like that. So I would, I would rather err on the other side. Yeah, because just because a photograph is technically perfect doesn't, doesn't mean it's a good that photograph. That doesn't mean it really that, matters. Yeah, that it matters. Okay, right. Great. Yeah. Um, when people come to this show, do you, what do you hope them to take away from it? Or how do you hope they look at these photographs okay. or these groupings of photos? Well, I haven't seen how the show is installed here, so it will be interesting for me to see sort of how, what kind of story this tells about my work, because I, I know that it's different than the way that I would put the sequences together. But what I do hope um, is that they find themselves encountering things that, images that surprise them, that they would not have um, imagined being um, like what they think about what's going on along the U.S.-Mexican border that they really never thought about like what it is like in particular, like what the human experience is like for people. So I would like for people to be surprised. Um, I would like for them to maybe wonder more about some of these um, uh, social situations, about these political situations, and maybe begin to read what they see in the newspaper or hear um, on radio or television, and maybe um, think a little bit more carefully about how, um, how maybe they form their opinions or how much they believe they actually understand about the full context. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention again here, this show is going to be up from November 13th, 2014, until January 6th of 2015. 
It is at the Gallery of Art and Design at the Elkhorn Valley Campus of Metropolitan Community College. And that is 829 North 204th Street, just north of the Dodge Street exit at 204th Street in Elkhorn, Nebraska. The gallery is open up from Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Saturday from 11 to 3. Um, so I hope that you'll take the time and come out and look at the show. And Terry, I really appreciate you sitting down and kind of talking about the work. And um, I hope you enjoy your stay here in, in Omaha. And um, thank you again very much. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'm Joseph Piper. This has been Gallery uh, Conversations. And we'll see you again next time. Mm -hmm.